I'd like to welcome I'd like to welcome um, Representative uh, Caroline Troy, um, who is in her fourth term representing District 5 and serves on the Appropriations uh, Committee as Vice Chair and Judiciary Rules and Administration Committees. Uh, Representative um, Gannon is in his fifth term representing District 17 and serves on the Ethics and House Policy Judiciary rules and administration and state affairs, as well as transportation and defense. Uh, now, is that true for this next session? Will you both be in, in the same committees? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Well, I'm, I'm going to, whichever one of you, I think, Caroline, are you starting first? Yeah, um, so I was wondering, could we screen sh share? I don't know how to do that. Sue? Caroline, at the bottom of, if you're on a desktop, at the bottom of your screen, there's a, it says screen share. Okay. And there's an arrow. Uh, well, yeah. you have open what it is you want to share, right? Yes. Okay, so if you hit the screen share button. Okay. And then it should show you what you have on your computer. Um, Click on that. that. Is it showing it to you guys? Is it showing it to you guys? Not until you share it. You have to click on the one you want. Okay. When I go into PowerPoint, my Zoom goes away. So let me try this again. Sorry, operator error. Hmm. Um, so I think you have to allow me to, because right now the only thing that it has is hit is only the host can share. You are now the host. Well, there you yeah. go. Watch out. <laughs> that is scary. Okay. Um, well, first of all, um, both John and I are, are very honored to be here. Um, we kind of put these uh, together today um, with the help of our clerk. And we're just going to take turns going back and forth and, and going over um, the slides. And then we'll before we leave it, we'll um, give, give each other the chance to make an additional comment. And we thought we would wait till the end for uh, questions, if that's all right. Yes, Carol, that's what we had planned. So okay, that's perfect. super. So um, um, I guess, John, I'll, I'll start with the first slide. So we thought what would might be helpful, and it, I, I believe everybody on the call is, is pretty knowledgeable about the process, but we just thought we would go over some common terms and um, a little bit about being on the floor before we talk about the, the exact way a bill goes through the, the um, body. So we um, obviously we start with an idea. Um, I love bringing ideas from my own district. Those are the ones that I'm most excited about. Um, and those bills start um, as, a, as a routing slip. I don't know why they gave them that name, but that's what they have the name of, a routing slip. And, and I work with the Legislative Services Office to draft that routing slip. That routing slip. If I'm working with a constituent, um, I, I, and I want them to be able to work on the legislation um, independently of me, then I sign off on a purple slip, and that gives Legislative Services the um, authority to work on the RS with me. Um, and it's really important to know that the RS is, is really my personal property until I either share it with someone or I, or, or I take it to the committee and present it to the committee. Um, once it goes to the committee um, and gets a bill number, it is a legal document and it's no longer my um, confidential document. It is in possession of the legislature. And so either the House or the Senate, depending on what side it started on. Um, I, I thought I would mention, because uh, sometimes people get confused, bills that originate in the House start with 
HB in front of them, and we start at 001. And the Senate bills start with Senate Bill SB, and they begin with 1001. And then as bills are added, you know, obviously those numbers accumulate. We are we just wrapped up the first regular session of the 66th legislature. Next year will be the second regular session of the 66th legislature. So we'll start those bills um, on the number that we let left off on um, at the end of this last session and, um, uh, and not taking into account the the bills that the 29 bills that the House introduced um, last week. So we ended on House Bill 435 in the House and the Senate uh, ended on Senate um, 1225. Uh, Caroline, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, sure, Caroline, sure. Do, do you intend to show slides? Um, because we're not seeing a screen, which is why I just wanted to let you know. Oh yeah, it's not showing the screen. Sorry. Oh, I'm glad. Well, that's why. That's why I was trying to hold it. We've got the slides, but this doesn't quite work either. So <laughs> I'm hold that. Sometimes we do have to improvise, but <laughs> and, uh, yeah, she's got. We got some great slides. Carolyn made most of them, uh, but I don't. I'm uh, share screen. Okay. You are the host. There we go. There we oh, go. I think we're on to something here. She started there screen sharing. Perfect. Thank you. Great. There we go. Wonderful. Yes, thank you for saying something. Is it still there? Yeah. Do you yes. see it? Okay. We've got the first one and now and then we now we need there you go. Yeah. Okay. So I'm and um so then um, each legislation legislative session is two years, and so the bill numbers start where the previous bill ended. But the bills from the last session, when we sign a dire adjourn, which that was a little um, different this year than it's ever been, those bills that didn't pass during that current year are dead. And so if there is a bill, because there were still some bills on, in play at the end of the session, um, and you can't go back and resurrect them. You have to start them all over as an as a new bill. John, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I can. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, we're gonna. Oh, we're gonna do those first. Okay. Uh, the uh, as backgrounds so as we go through this. We thought it'd be helpful to just discuss uh, what happens on the House floor. Now, this is uh, this is some this isn't uh, what happens after you have your RS. What the following uh, slide will show that. But uh, any of you who have watched the House proceedings probably have heard the uh, speaker or whoever is uh, acting the speaker say that we're going to order number one or order number eight. Uh, we're back to order number five. Um, the orders are essentially um, uh, a, 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 a 16 different uh, processes or 16 different phases that we go through uh, and they keep the, keep the process orderly so that, so that um, I guess that's why they're called orders, right? And uh, but they keep they keep the process so that it's very predictable what we're going to be doing and where we are going to go uh, each legislative day. And so obviously the first one is a roll call, uh, seconds prayer and the pledge. Then we approve the journal, which is the official record of the House. Uh, then we receive messages from the governor and Senate. And if there's a veto, this is where. Uh, we would receive those messages. We repeat receive uh, reports from the standing committees. Uh, we most recently, that was very important because the ethics committee uh, sent a report on what we recommended should happen in regard to a, a, um, a representative. And uh, this at the fifth order was where we uh, considered that. Uh, the sixth order select committees uh, reports. Um, then, uh, if we if there's a resolution, that's in the seventh. 
uh, committee, uh, seventh order, and uh, and on down. You can you can see what they all are. Um, the important thing about the orders is uh, another is that sometimes if you go past an order, then you can't go back. And for example, uh, the report of the ethics committee uh, regarding a particular representative, if that if that report had not been acted on in the fifth order when the speaker said, okay, it's the fifth order, if nobody had made a motion, they would have got, the speaker would have gone uh, ahead with the sixth order. And it may have been very difficult to go back to the fifth order and act on the report. So you kind of get a little technical maneuvering going on in some of, the, in, in some of this, but the um, important thing to remember is there are different steps, different stages, different, um, um, uh, I, I kind of like uh, that you have to go through every day. And uh, so in, 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 and then eventually you get to the uh, adjournment. And um, in, in some of these orders can be disrupted by an objection, um, uh, a technical objection. So then there has to be a vote, a uh, formal vote, because uh, you have, might have to, the speaker might say, well, unanimous consent, we're going to go back from the 11th order back to the 7th order because we need to do something. And if nobody objects, it's fine. But if one person objects, then you have to have a vote to do it. Um, so that's, that's the um, way business is conducted on the floor, on the House floor. And I guess what I'd like to add, and John and I talked about this, um, the Senate sometimes has, um, they have very similar rules, but they can have different rules than the House does. And they like to remind us that their rules are different. And John and I reflected on some of um, our experience on the Joint Finance and Appropriation Committee because that committee operates under the Senate rules. And as House members, we're not as, um, are familiar with those rules. Um, and of course we think we're the best body of the legislature. And so um, we, we don't ever pay that much attention to their rules. Um, and I did wanna say that how the process works is if it follows some um, precedence, order of precedence. So it starts with our state constitutional provisions and then judicial decision. So that directs us, that's our top prior, that's the, the top driver of how we do business. Then adopted rules, um, house rules, and then joint rules. We do have some joint rules with the Senate. Um, custom usage and pre precedent. Um, so like oftentimes a court cases, precedent does um, matter. Um, statutory provisions. Um, our parliamentary authority is Mason's rules, which is different than most clubs use. Um, and so that was kind of a new um, learning curve for me was to get familiar with Mace, the Mason's manual. Um, can you listen through your earbuds? I mean, your oh, I guess I can. And then, um, and then the final one is um, parliamentary law. So um, that's what drives this process. Um, and I put an, another slide in here. John hasn't really seen this. Sorry, John. Um, I thought it would be interesting. We have different levels of voting for different things. So it's a simple majority. So in the House, 36 votes. And that allows us to pa pass rules, pass bills, um, memorials, and concurrent resolution to reconsider bills. So um, we can make a motion if we voted a certain way and the bill passed. So like if I voted no and the bill passed, do you have to be on the prevailing side, side to say that you would reconsider? I, you can say that you'd like to reconsider and that allows you to bring the whole bill back. Yeah, you do um, have to be on the prevailing side, correct, yeah. You have to be on the prevailing side to reconsider. Um, and you have to ask for reconsider before you move out of the, the um, order of business that the voting is in. Um, and then a motion to call bill out of committee. We've had that happen a couple of times um, to call a bill out of committee, but it's normally failed. We, we're, well, it's always failed um, in, my, in my experience. We are really committed to the committee process. 
and um, and when it doesn't go through the committee process, it it just um, causes all, all sort of angst. And so um, those kind of games have not been very successful, but many of them have been played. So then two thirds of the entire membership, so two thirds of the 70 um, have to agree to suspend rules, to alter or amend rules, the house rules, to pass joint resolutions, uh, take a bill from the table or um, expel a member. Two thirds of the members present, um, so if there's only 65 people in, in the room, just two thirds of those can vote to withdraw bills, memorials of resolution, uh, move to a previous question in order to end debate. But we did have that happen in our, our last session and um, it, it, I don't even know if it got 15 votes. Um, it's just kind of frowned upon amending joint rules. So those are the rules that we have with the Senate and then overturning a governor's veto. So there's kind of um, a hierarchy of items that uh, need more votes. And I, um, one of the things that Sue talked about that the membership was really interested in is it seems that at times bills are expedited through the system. And so John and I are gonna be talking about that. And that's why it's important to understand that when we suspend rules, and so our rules of going through the order of business, which is the, the bills have to follow, two thirds of the entire membership have to agree to suspend the rules in order to um, monkey around with the um, order of business. So we, um, we thought that was important to kind of talk about. John. What's the next uh, next slide? Okay. Uh, now this is, uh, we're gonna talk about the, you, you've got your RS that we talked about two slides ago, which is the is the basic uh, proposed bill, proposed bill. And you present, and once the, uh, once the sponsors, everybody who's supporting this bill have agreed on what it should look like, the RS is presented to the committee for introduction and the committee can move the print or they can return it to sponsors. Say, no, we don't wanna hear this bill. Um, oftentimes if it's returned to sponsor, it's not coming back. Sometimes it does. Uh, but here is where just before, the, before it is presented to the committee is probably the most, uh, one of the most important parts of the legislative process. Because before it's presented to the committee, the sponsors should have talked to a couple of political uh, of members, uh, maybe representing different political viewpoints to different parts of the state, and said, "Hey, uh, member, what do you what do you think about this? Um, is this something that you think that you and colleagues you work with can support?" Um, it's it's there's a lot of homework that goes into this, and of course, there's probably. Uh, some interest groups that you need to talk to. Uh, if it's one that affects uh, business, then you probably need to talk to the business people because um, it, your bill may not get printed, might not much less get a, get a hearing if it is printed. Um, a lot of homework goes into uh, putting together your RS and, prior to the introduction to the committee. And after, you, after all the, that work is done, and that's really where probably, I'll bet two thirds of the, well, maybe half the work on a bill is done, is, is getting the different groups that might care about what you're doing and uh, involved, and maybe they wanna tweak it. Maybe there's something that you've got in your RS that you didn't realize was gonna put uh, an industry out of business, and it just never occurred to anybody. Oh my goodness, you know. So um, there, there's, there's all that work. Then you go to the committee with your RS and ask them to print the bill, which means it will be printed, circulated, given a bill number, and, uh, and then move forward for a hearing. Now, that's another important point because sometimes, sometimes the bill gets printed and the chairman doesn't hear the bill. And usually the chair won't hit the, hear the bill because one interest group or another or some representatives 
are saying, oh, we really, we don't feel comfortable with this bill. We don't want, we don't want to uh, see this bill move forward. And we don't want to spend two hours hearing about it because we're going to, we're going to not support it anyway. And it's not going to go through the committee. So uh, there again, uh, if you've done all your homework before you get it printed, you're, you're not going to run into uh, an obstacle where suddenly it won't be printed. Uh, it won't be, won't have a hearing. And the hearing is, of course, when many of you uh, and, and supporters and enthusiasts would, would testify and say, we really like this bill. So um, then once, if it passes out of committee and it has to pass by a majority vote out of committee and there's a number of committee um, rules that, that can, uh, or a number of committee motions that can be made. Uh, once it's passed, it goes to the, uh, uh, I think we just said the eighth order, yes, eighth order. And, uh, and it is, that's called the second reading calendar. Then it goes to the third reading calendar and that's pretty much automatic. And then on the third reading calendar, we vote. Now, not every bill that goes, gets on the third reading calendar ends up getting voted on. That's kind of a weird deal too, because all of a sudden someone, some group, somebody realizes, hey, there's a problem. So I'll turn it over to, um, um, uh, back to Caroline to go ahead with this next slide. Sure. So uh, what I wanted to make sure you understand, there's a lots of ways that bills can get derailed. So they can get derailed when you first take the idea to the chairman, because the chairman has to agree to introduce the RS. And if they don't like it, that they'll say, no, I don't like it. And they don't have to give you a reason. They just say they don't like it. So, so before you even get it printed, it, it could get derailed. Um, then once it's printed, then you have a hearing um, as, as John was talking about, um, a print hearing, and that's usually when we're trying to get as many people that we know are supporting a, that supporting that bill from as many different places of the state to come in. Some people are really masterful at that. I, I'm not as masterful at it. Um, I'll tell you, Melissa Wintrow is probably the best one I ever knew. She's fabulous at that. Um, and anyway, and then so they come and and present. The lobbyists can w will often come and present um, at that time, um, and uh, and the committee will have their debate, and it has to pass out of the committee um, with a majority vote. And there's uh, uh, several things that they can do. They can pass it out of committee with a due pass. That, that it goes to the floor with a due pass recommendation, or it can go to the floor without recommendation. That's pretty rare, but we've seen some bills in the last um, couple of years where they've had uh, no recommendation. Or they can, um, they can hold them in committee. They can do it two ways. They can hold them in committee or they can hold them for a time certain. And sometimes they'll hold it if there's just like one little tweak that needs to get made and they wanna give people enough time to do that. Um, they can send them to general orders and general orders is a little bit of a crapshoot. And um, because uh, if there's a problem with the bill and you've you during the hearing you've heard what the issues are, you, where's you the big can, ball? Right, you work with legislative services to make an amendment to that bill, and then it goes to general orders. That's a, a whole different floor session. It's it's um, overseen by the assistant majority leader, not the speaker of the house or the majority leader, and um, you have to have somebody stand up and. Uh, make the motion, but there can be competing motions. Once you put it to general orders, anybody can come in and make an amendment to it. Um, and um, it, it always surprises me the risk that people take sending stuff to general orders. You have to be pretty certain that your bill isn't going to get hijacked when if you send it to general orders. Um, so you have to be pretty certain it came strong out of the committee. There wasn't a, a lot of disagreement in committee. Um, I've had a couple bills go to general orders, but I've never liked it. I would rather start over again and fix it and, and start from scratch. They go to a third reading calendar. 
Um, John and I also wanted to just talk, I, I skipped by this, but there's also personal bills and there's a kindness in the Idaho legislature um, and people come with their you know, their pet ideals and their their issues that they want to get out there in the universe. And you can do a personal bill. And how that works is you, you work with legislative services, you draft up an RS, you take the RS to the clerk's office before the 20th day of the legislature. And, um, and the clerk assigns a bill number to it. And then it comes up in the, um, correct order on the floor and then the um, speaker has the authority to send it to a committee um, or send it to ways and means and usually in early in the session if it goes to ways and means it just goes to die but that does give people um, you know a piece of paper that they can wave around and say look look I have this bill that got printed well it didn't get printed through the committee process um, it and it was never intended to go through the committee process, but there's a lot of bills that get printed that way. So how you can tell if it's one of the, a personal bill. So if I have a bill and I take it to ju Judiciary and Rules, it's House Bill for, 411 uh, Judiciary and Rules. But if it's my own personal bill, um, Beagle should become the national dog of choice because I have a Beagle. Um, it could have a bill number, and um, but it would likely to go to ways and means. So, um, and it would say House Bill 411, Troy. The sponsor is Troy, so it doesn't have a committee sponsor. So that's how you can tell um, if it's a personal bill. I sometimes run into people that are talking about their bills and how much work they've done and, and their bill got shut down and their bill is a personal bill. I'm like, well, duh, of course it got shot down. You knew it was gonna get shot down. Why did you do it that way? If, you, if you're that committed to it, do the hard work and get it over the finish line. Um, but. Oh, I, uh, wanted to, I wanted to add um, what we're talking about the uh, committee uh, system. The, the, chair, the chair of the committee does set the agenda. And uh, so the, the chair has to, uh, uh, and, and there's only so much time. So if a bill is going to take two, three hours and it's in uh, uh, a hearing, and there's a ton of people who want to testify, pro and con, whatever, um, the chair has to take that into consideration. I, you know, at first you think, oh, well, it's the chair just decides what to do, just makes a decision in a vacuum. But I, I think I found uh, working closely with a number of chairs that really what happens is they talk to members in the committee. And I, I know this happened on revenue tax. I know this happens on state affairs. Um, and, you know, do you want to hear this bill? Is this something you want to spend time on? Uh, they talk to some of the key uh, uh, interest groups that are interested in the bill. Uh, is it, you know, how do you feel about this bill? And, and if they're getting a lot of negative feedback, um, that will influence whether it goes on the calendar. I've never, I, you know, at first when I joined the legislature, I thought, oh, you know, Chairman Jones is just going to, uh, you know, doesn't like this bill, no chance. It's not always that Chairman Jones doesn't like the bill. It may be that he, he uh, was speaking for um, interest groups for um, members who didn't want to hear the darn thing. They don't want to. They don't want to deal with that issue. And and they some of the members may not want to cast a recorded vote on a particular issue. Um, and um, and they would just as soon avoid it. And so that's that's a lot that goes into it. And so I go back to what I said earlier. Um, before you even get that bill printed in the committee, you have to do a lot of homework and a lot of work. And, um, that's, and that's absolutely key. Otherwise it can get derailed as Carolyn said at several places and she pointed it out. And, and I would just point out that even though a bill makes the third reading, which one of mine did, um, and I had 
uh, leadership, a uh, couple of the leaders supporting that bill. Um, it got out of committee almost unanimously and got to the floor and it got up there and it just, um, uh, there, was, uh, there was considerable opposition um, from, uh, fr from a couple of uh, interested, from interested parties and uh, it never got a vote. We had to take it off the calendar and, um, and it was never voted on. So um, it's, it's interesting how, how these things proceed. The more and homework you do, the better chance you got. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I, I think what's really interesting is that the bills have to go through a similar process on the Senate side. So they have just as many opportunities to get derailed on the Senate side. So, you know, as you've got to be thinking like three or four steps ahead, you know, who do I need to make sure I'm getting on board? And, and you know, I usually start with the chairman. If the chairman won't hear it, you know, re really, if they won't hear it, what are you going to do? Um, uh, sometimes I've started bills in the Senate if the chairs in the House won't make it, but I don't do that very often. And nobody ever knows when I do it because that would probably be a uh, uh, a hard thing to recover from. <laughs> um, and, and that's what we did. Carolyn and I had a, uh, a little bill last session that we worked on together um, uh, regarding uh, tenant security deposits. And uh, uh, she, I think actually Carolyn did the recruiting on that one. She recruited a, a popular uh, Senator and to carry it in the Senate. So that when it did get over there, um, we had somebody as an advocate for it, um, and uh, and then of course we both worked on it in the house, um, and even then there was there was opposition, and um, I think it only passed thirty seven thirty one in the house or something like that, and there were some Senate votes against it, but uh, it was a really good bill uh, to um, clean up a loophole where people where property managers were. Uh, taking security deposits and using it to pay their own personal bills. And then when they went bankrupt, of course, there were no security deposits left and the tenants were left uh, holding the bag or the owners for that matter, because the owners had to deal with the mad tenant. And uh, so it, it was, but anyway, th that's an example of you have to plan ahead for what's going to happen in the Senate because you don't want to do all this work in the house, get it passed. And, and like I say, it was a little bit of a challenge because it was a regulation bill and there's a group that does not like regulation bills, period, and uh, of any kind. And uh, so, and it got passed and you would hate to do all that work and then, and then get stopped in the Senate. So you have to remember there's two of them and you can start the bill in the Senate and send it to the House. That's done too. Um, and uh, people, sponsors look at different, political reasons for doing that it's probably uh, uh, there's probably a lot of them a lot and of that them. and that co-sponsor on the senate side sometimes makes a difference on the house floor on how many votes that they get so you know if you get if you get people go oh you got so-and-so to be your co-sponsor on the senate wow how'd you do that um i'm really good at baking and so <laughs> uh, i have no shame and um anyway so that does make a difference all right, so it goes through the committee process. It could go to general orders, I think. Um, the Senate process, I don't know if you want to talk about this, John. Well, I think, um, let's see, this is, this is a House bill, goes to the Senate. Um, uh, and so what we're describing in this slide is, is that process. We're not describing the Senate bill going to the House, which is, which is very similar to what we've been describing uh, for the House process, but um, when it, when the bill goes to the Senate, the uh, Senate is referred to the uh, appropriate Senate committee, and uh, once again, you've got to deal with the chair of the committee, and that chair, um, again, um, did the different factors, the interest groups, the the Senate members of the committee, um, and if you have a sponsor for your bill who's a member of the particular committee it goes to, that is very helpful. So um, um, you, wanna, you wanna pick that Senate sponsor and get, the, get, a, get that sponsor committed too. 
uh, you know, just not putting my name on it, but I'm actually going to talk to the chairman and and try to get get it uh, get it get a hearing for this bill and and get it through. Um, and again, the committee process, um, um, the committee can send it to to uh, uh, the tenth. I think it's the tenth order is what they call it in the Senate, which is the amending order. Um, or they they can. Uh, uh, the committee can pass it and send it to the floor with due pass, or the committee can vote, no, we don't like this bill and we're going to hold it. Um, Senate oftentimes admit, seems to uh, amend House bills. We see a lot of them uh, get amended, and that's okay. That's, that's what the process is about. And then, and, then they, and, then, uh, and then they get passed in the Senate and come back to the House. Um, the... Um, um, the failed bills filed in the office of the clerk. Um, and I'll just and I'll just briefly say what happens when it uh, when it's amended because um, the uh, if it's passed, of course, then as is, then the bill goes to the governor. But if it's amended, it comes back to the house, and then the house has to concur in the amendment that the share that the Senate made to the house bill, and so then we have a vote. To concur, and that's usually a, um, um, it's usually um, fairly, some, well, it's often informal. Sometimes it'll actually go back to the committee and be reviewed by the committee, but most often it's uh, 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 the sponsor in the House would say, would, would rise uh, and at the appropriate order and say, um, ask that uh, you can, that the House concur and the amendments to uh, House bill, num whatever number, and then the House would vote by majority vote to do that or, or not do that. But as I say, it's usually done, usually happens. I remember, uh, I remember a couple of times when it didn't happen, but usually there is concurrence and then it goes on to the governor. And of course, at that point, the governor uh, can veto it after all of this. It gets amended and it, you know, finally passes through the House and it gets to the Senate, comes back amended to the House, the House approves, and then the governor vetoes it. You know, uh, but that doesn't happen very often either. But that that could happen. It's it's not a not a smooth passage just because it gets gets that far. So um, a couple of things about the amending process. It seems like there's friendly amendments and they do make the policy better. Um, there's unfriendly amendments and then there's radiator caps. And so radiator caps are um, something that the Senate, they haven't done it as much recently, but they're really good at it. All um, tax bills have to start in the House. And so we'll pass a tax bill in the House and we'll send it over to the Senate and they don't like it. So they radiator cap it. What that means is all they do is keep the bill number and everything else in that bill is different. And so, um, and so then those bills, when they come back to the House, are likely to go back to committee for a hearing. Um, and it does make everybody very grumpy. Um, it makes the Senate really proud of themselves and makes all the House members really grumpy. And then um, sometimes they pass, sometimes they don't. We had that on grocery tax. Um, we had a grocery tax bill that passed the House. We sent it to the Senate. They sent it back as an income tax bill. We sent it back to them as a grocery tax bill. Um, and I, and then they killed it. So um, we there's, I tell everybody, you can tell where we're at in the session. At the beginning of the session, we love each other. We're so excited to see each other. It's great. Then um, we start doing um, we do rules review. That's a whole nother thing that's very interesting. Um, but the Idaho does rules reviews differently than anybody else does, I think. Um, and then we start hating the agencies because they took our laws and they made crazy rules out of it and we have to fix their rules. And so we think the agencies are terrible and that's the governor's fault. And then um, we we start sending stuff over the Senate and they start sending it back and then we start getting angry at the Senate. And by the end of the session, we all just hate everybody. And so it's time to go home. Um, so it's really funny that, I don't know, John, you're smiling, but it kind of does go that way. Um, well, the other- uh, Yes, yes, uh, I concur. Um, yeah. uh, you know, and it, but you, you reminded me of something as we were talking about, about this. And 
could we go back to the slide, uh, the slide uh, with the committee, back to the committee? Um, yep, there you are. Um, let's, let's see. Um, well, at any rate, back back at the committee process, the in number one, you talked a, talked a lot about how you should have your bill prepared. Um, but let's say you do, you're against a bill, and you don't like a bill. You know the IRS has come in, and you 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 all see it, and you say, "Oh, gee, we, you know, there's something we don't like here, whatever." Um, two things. Two things there. Uh, first of all, if you can find out that a bill is coming and there's something you want in it or that you can't live with, or you kind of know, hey, you know, I know what they're up to, you know, sometimes you may want to work with the sponsors and see if you can make their bill uh, more palatable. Um, but if not, and it gets printed, then you're in the defensive mode. And at that point, um, you want to look through that bill, um, get your get your arguments in a row or your your viewpoint in a row, and maybe even talk to the sponsor and say, hey, you know, if you just change, you know, we've got five objections, but if you could just change two of our objections, we'll we'll support we'll we'll go away, we'll just disappear. We're not going to support you, but we're going to disappear, and. Um, um, we won't be there to speak against the bill. Or you might say, um, well, if you'll send it to general orders and make this change, you know, we'll go away or disappear, you know, those kinds of things. So um, that's more the, the, uh, the defensive mode. Um, and so one thing you, you need to think about when you're opposing any legislation is, is there any room for us to compromise here? And there may not be, I mean, Many times I look at a bill and I, well, there's nothing that can happen there that would make me happy, right? But um, if there is some room to compromise and your members say, well, you know, we could live, we don't like this bill, but we could live if they just change paragraph two and paragraph six, we'll just go away and live to, live to uh, uh, legislate another day, you know? Um, <clears throat> that is an approach that you should always consider uh, as as you go through this process, and even after the committee and and uh, on the floor, if 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 between the committee and the floor you found out that oh yeah this this is not a good idea for this reason, once again you might approach the sponsors and say you know we're having a problem we we noticed this very serious problem and it could mean you don't get your bill passed here or in the Senate or something and. You know, we don't want to make a big deal out of it, but maybe you can make this change or, you know, this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I wanted to also mention that if the governor vetoes a bill, he usually sends a letter to um, the, the House, which is read on the floor, so it's in the records of why he vote, vetoed a bill. He can let a bill become law without signing it. Um, and he did that on the hemp legislation. Um, poor Governor Little hates marijuana and um, he really struggled with hemp. And so that just went into law without his signature. He wanted to support agriculture and allowing our farmers to produce and process hemp, but he just couldn't stomach signing it. So, um, and I, you know, I appreciate that uh, about the governor. He's, he's um, really upfront about that stuff. So I think the thing that, and it goes to the Senate does the same thing. I, I think the one thing that you guys are really interested in is towards the end of the session, it seems that bills fly around um, up and down the order. And so we wanted to walk through that process. And so I just wanted to say it's, it's allowed under the Idaho constitution in case of emergency that we can suspend readings of the bills. Um, and whatever three several days means. But this is where we go back to that two thirds of all members affirmative vote. So um, there's a couple different ways that this can work. So um, at the end of the session, a lot of times an RS is introduced into the Ways and Means Committee. And on the House side, that's um, our le leadership committee. On the Senate side, it's State Affairs is their leadership committee. They sent it to the clerk's office for a, a number. So everything happens the same, but it's it goes across the second, the first reading calendar. And per our constitution, we have to read the bills three times. And I think that's going back to the days where um, 
you know, we didn't, you couldn't look up the bills online or they couldn't get printed fast enough. So um, they're supposed to be read three times and read in full on the third time. Um, and so um, the majority leader has to move to suspend the rules preventing consideration of, the, of a bill. Um, and so we have to vote two thirds of all members and that that bill is that the, the rules are suspended and we are allowed to go down and pick up bills off of the second reading calendar and put them on the third reading calendar, jump over, jump around bills. We just use that same, same suspension for that rule. When we're getting clear to the end and oftentimes it's a tax bill that holds us up um, we've talked about it over and over and over again until we're all sick to death of whatever the topic is that's coming up at the end of the of the session. And they seem like you know they know that we want to go home. They 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 finally say okay we're gonna we're gonna print this and we're gonna vote on it. Um, that's I think when people get really anxious because we oftentimes don't know what's coming if we're not on that committee. I mean, I'm not on Revintax, so I have no clue what's coming. Um, it, it'll it, that it'll get introduced into Ways and Means. Um, it'll go to the first reading calendar. Um, it, it'll get the bill, and then it'll go to the second reading calendar. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll go at ease so that the things in the background that usually take a day with the clerk's office on moving these bills around and making sure all the procedures are in place, we go at ease so that the clerks can do all of those procedures that are outlined in just a regular bill. Um, and then we, when we come back on the floor and if we vote for suspension, we'll go and pick up um, those, those bills. Um, it, it, it does seem like we're sidestepping the process. We just put it on uh, super fast speed at the end um, and um, sometimes if, if our, like sometimes our um, computers are down or our internet is down and they have to stop because unless we have the opportunity to read it, um, we, we are, aren't allowed to proceed with it. Um, John, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add and then I think we should go to some questions. Uh, just to add that the, uh, the reference to the tax bill is exactly right. I think as you watch the next session, uh, as you know, there's a huge budget, a uh, huge surplus right now. So there will be a tax bill. Uh, it will probably be vigorously um, argued uh, in the Senate and the House. Uh, there probably be a couple of bills that will go back and forth, and then eventually something will be settled on it'll be probably in the last couple of days and that process this process this expedited process will probably be the way it happens and um, um, it's uh, it's it's usually I, I would say it usually is a tax bill sometimes there's another big bill or two but usually that's when this process comes into play that was terrific um, it, actually, there were so many things like the orders as, as you watch the, the session and they skip around these orders. It was great to understand what they mean and why <laughs> they would jump around. That's, that's very, very helpful. Um, and I, if people would like to ask questions, now is, now is the time. All those burning questions that you have um, while, while people are... Um, Going to the reactions, uh, I'm I'm gonna just ask uh, uh, one. I I enjoy the term uh, radiator cap. <laughs> I'll remember that this this, <laughs> this next session. When when the expedited um, process happens in committee, it seems like the trade off is um, less input from the public. And I just wanted to ask you what you what you think about that expedited process and how the public input is actually taken into consideration. It, it, well, I think it's it, that expedited process is usually at the end of the session. So there's usually been a lot of discussion about the particular issue, and let's just say taxes, because I think that's going to be there. There's usually been a lot of discussion about it. Um, in the in the committee and there's been 
proposals that have left the committee, then they go to the Senate, of course, and they're heard at the Local Government and Taxation Committee. So there's another hearing there. And then, uh, then it gets amended, come back, it comes back, you know, back and forth, back and forth. So I think that's where a lot of the discussions is. And then finally, at the end, yeah, you're right. Uh, there's very little public input into the final, uh, final, final. But there has been public input on the different uh, versions of the final, final, so to speak. And, um, and, and there's been a lot of, um, uh, of thought there. So, um, yeah, it would be, it, yeah, there, there is no public hearing for usually that final, final. It's run through ways and means, and it's run through the Senate, and then we adjourn. And uh, that's a problem. Uh, and the only thing I would say is that there has been prior, a lot of prior discussion on the different versions of it. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Jean and then Kathy Dawes. Okay. I've been cooking dinner, so I apologize for looking like I do. <laughs> um, but I, I guess I have two impossible questions for both of you. Um, number one, um, we had heard from individuals that this particular session will be about throwing red meat at the base because everyone's up for election. So what can we expect in terms of priorities? And I guess that folds those two questions together. So I will go offline because yeah, <laughs> your answers. Thank you. Well, I, I mean, I'm sure John has ideas. I think uh, taxes are going to be the issue. What does that look like? Is it property taxes? Is it income taxes? Is it sales tax? You know, I remain concerned about how we're funding schools, how we're funding school facilities. I'm concerned that we're setting up uh, teachers versus facilities in some of these rural communities that can't afford to do both. Um, and, and the property tax stories that we're hearing are, are very, are, are getting very difficult to hear. There are people losing their homes, um, people uh, that just can't make ends meet. And, um, and everybody's, I mean, there's 105 of us and we all are super opinionated and we think we know the best path forward. And um, it's, uh, it, it's uh, it, I think that's gonna be probably one of the biggest things and and then the uh, vaccination and the mandates um how we handle how how we handle that you know and what and what's sad is there's a lot of really um good policy that i think uh we could be moving ahead with um especially around uh foster care around the department of corrections um they're doing some really uh, interesting things and um and we've had we we have such a huge budget surplus. That I I'm afraid it's just going to be a food fight. So I don't know, John, what you think. Well, taxes definitely I think will be a big one. And and like like you said, Jean, um, there will be a lot of playing to the primary voter. Uh, and and so uh, I I see some um, efforts to. Uh, prove that uh, a legislator is more is more in tune with uh, particular hot button issues than another legislator moderates versus conser conservatives kind of thing um, but I, so i see a lot of that uh, as as something that's just going to happen and and um, uh, because because of the primaries uh, but taxes you know the property tax income tax corporate um, it'll, uh, is all there, um, big issue. Um, salaries, I think is kind of interesting because we just raised the correctional officer salaries 20%, uh, from roughly 1650 an hour to 1975 and had to do that because we didn't have anybody applying for the job. And, um, so it's going to be interesting to see how the other, uh, state employees are treated and, and, and what happens there. That's an expense that, um, but abortion, guns, uh, I see those bills coming in to prove that, to prove to the uh, primary voter that you were, are uh, on the uh, right side of the, those issues. 
Uh, uh, John, where do you see critical race theory? Uh, oh, I suspect that'll go. Oh, yeah, that'll be there. You know, it's it's uh, it'll be there. Um, it's uh, I mean, to me, it's it's unclear as to exactly where that um, um, where that uh, where that actually is. Uh, I mean, what that actually is and where that actually is being taught, but it will be raised. Um, it's a hot button issue, just like guns and abortion. And uh, so, yes, that'll be there. And who's, who's going to protect our kids from critical race theory, uh, the, str the strongest. Um, vaccination mandates, as Carolyn said, will, it's an obvious one that is going to uh, uh, you know, who's, who's, who's more for liberty, who isn't for liberty. Um, there, so I, I expect a lot of that. Um, education uh, is, uh, I hope education's in the forefront. Um, and uh, especially with this, with this excess funding. I mean, think, think about this, if the correction officers are not going to make 1975 an hour, plus a $1,500 bonus, which would be equal to 75 cents an hour, 2,000 hours. Um, that's 2050 an hour they're making, and the starting salary for a teacher is 40,000. So, um, and then our senior teachers are simply not um, getting um, uh, additional funding. Of course, I'm talking about K through 12 there. Uh, and so um, the, the, we, we need to do something for the senior teachers, to keep them, um, uh, the, the, the ones we want to keep. So um, I hope that's a big issue and I hope that's a big priority. I'm not sure it will be, but uh, for me it will be. And I'm sure for uh, many legislators uh, it will be. And, and hopefully it, it'll be something that um, we're successful in, in, in supporting. I think our rural schools especially need, need a lot more help uh, and uh, than, than they've been getting. Thank you, Kathy. Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for all that you put together on this slideshow because it explained a lot of details that I was not aware of. So that helped a lot. Um, I wanna tell you about my experience in following the legislature this last year. Uh, I would go to a committee, watch for what RS numbers showed up, and a topic, that's all I really could see at that point. But if I went to the committee meeting, I could hear the uh, sponsor of the bill explain it a little bit. And I would say, ooh, that sounds really interesting. I'd like to know more. So it has an RS number now of 163574, whatever, okay? From there, it goes to get a bill number. But I cannot find anywhere on the website where it, converts to a bill number that I can then go and look at the actual bill. What, we, what is really needed, and I'm going to make this request of you maybe to take back to the legislature or the people who um, could set this up, is a simple chart that shows this RS number becomes this bill. And then I can go to the bill registry, you know, in the, on the website and find that bill number, click on it and read the bill. Because what happens is, especially when the legislature is moving very fast, as you mentioned, it does, I can't get there fast enough to say, I want to testify on this bill because I don't know what the bill number is. So can I ask you to maybe- No, that's, that's a great suggestion. I will definitely follow up with, and we have a new director of legislative services and I'll ask Terry if, she, if, she, if they could consider how to do that. Great, thank you so much. Yeah. And I think, yeah, cool. Kathy, you're you're one of the ones that has testified at state affairs, right? I've testified right. in several yeah. committees. Yes. Yes, I recognize the last name. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And we really I really appreciate that. Um, it's very important that all of you participate in this process to the extent that you're you have the time and testify. And I know sometimes it sounds seems like well, there's going to be you know, my position is going to be trounced in the committee or something like that. But it's, it's very important that you be there and, and, uh, and give your viewpoints because uh, especially last session with COVID, the only people we were hearing from at state affairs 
were about 50 people. There was a group of about 50 that were that had a particular viewpoint. And, and whether I agree with the viewpoint or not, they, they kind of dominated uh, a lot of the discussion because they were actually in the room and, and they would testify every time. And, and so uh, you folks that testified on Zoom were so important as a balance to that and, and just making sure that everybody knew that, hey, there's, there's, there may be two viewpoints. And, that, and there were some on Zoom uh, from, uh, from outside of Boise who testified uh, in accord with the people that were, in the, were, were, were usually in the committee, but it's important. Uh, very, very important. And, and it's so important that I worry that we might lose that opportunity uh, if we don't use it. So, yes, that's true too. Yeah, so we've got to do it. We, those of us who are way far away from Boise need to really speak up on, uh, on Zoom. Yeah. yeah. I think that was a, a great advancement. Um, it really is really unfair to not have an, uh, the ability to have people come uh, I, I remember, you know, my mother flying down in snowstorms to testify yeah. from northern Idaho. And and it just seems like, you know, if one good thing came out of this, people being able to testify on Zoom from all over the state was just it was just a huge asset, I think, for everyone. And um, and I'm, so I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned testifying because um, I think uh, it's it's good to hear whether you know, committee members are actually listening to these testimonies and hearing and actually digesting and kind of absorbing that into the decision making. And it sounds like, at least for you two, it sounds like that's an important part of well, your decision making. Well, we have to listen, uh, I mean, the, to the Zoom because there, well, in, in state affairs, for example, we've got three different, three different um, uh, places where the Zoom shows up. So uh, it's impossible not to. And uh, even if you didn't want to listen, and uh, and so um, uh, you know you you look straight at the at the screens at a screen one way or another, no matter where you're sitting in that room. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so it's and and um, and as you may know, that was the result of two lawsuits uh, that had to be filed to get get that Zoom going. But um, it uh, it it I'm so glad we have it. In person is best. It's still the best, uh, but Zoom is uh, very close to being very uh, the best too. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Thank everybody tonight for for coming, but particularly Representatives Gannon and, and Troy. That was just an excellent presentation, and um, it was I think everybody would find that extremely helpful. I'm sorry, uh, Ann. Ann. Oh, her, okay. <laughs> her hand was raised. A clap, it was a clap. I'm sorry. I thought oh, it was a hand oh, raised. Sorry, it's a actually, clap. Yes, a clap from all of us. Absolutely. Thank actually, you so much. Do we, do we have time for one more question? I think uh, I do have a question. I forgot all about this. Um, you talked about how bills become laws, but how do resolutions work? Can you do that real quickly? Or is well, you, that. You probably remember that controversy if you follow state affairs because. In the beginning uh, of the session, there was an effort to pass a concurrent resolution to restrict the governor's powers. Mm -hmm. And a resolution uh, only goes through the House and the Senate. It doesn't go to the governor's desk. Right. And so uh, eventually uh, uh, there were some AG opinions, et cetera, and eventually that idea was dropped. But, but uh, they go through a, the same process, but there's just they're just voted on by the House and the Senate, and they're limited on what they can do. Do uh, they get a hearing? Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah, I think they, I, I, they get a hearing, but if they're not controversial, Kathy, they often get sent straight to the second reading count calendar. Okay. So if there's a memorial or a resolution that is just like, well, like we did a resolution last year for Eric Milstead, who is our longtime legislative services director and it just went straight to the second reading calendar um if it if it didn't doesn't appear like it needs a, a lot it's not controversial and that's true of memorials uh, resolutions um you know if they're not controversial they don't get a full hearing and some of that too is up to the legislator like if 
you know, if I had something that I was doing as a, as a resolution or a memorial or a concurrent resolution, and I wanted to get a lot of press about it, then I could ask for a hearing if I just say, you know, I, I'm working on one for this year and it, you know, it's a, a, a death of a, of a um, wonderful Idahoan and do we need a committee hearing to waste committee time on that? I'd rather spend the time on the floor and, and honor that person on the floor than, than in the committee. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much again. Uh, and I just, one, one last thing, is it possible to get the slide deck? Absolutely, um, I, I'm happy to send it to you. Thank you, uh, thank you. It, maybe send me an email. I don't know if I have your email. Okay, I will send you a request and, and then we can distribute it to yeah. the people that came tonight. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm much. glad that that worked because that I, I called delightful. John this afternoon. I was like, John, <laughs> I'm an advertising major. I can't do this without slides. Yeah, <laughs> Visual, there you go. Visuals are good. They're good. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. So, Thanks yeah, for thank having you. us. It's been fun. Yeah, Bye -bye. good night.